I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susan. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. Hey there, ghosts, schools, and everything in between. We at the Savannah Underground are extremely excited to say that we have officially launched our Patreon. The link is in our description, or you can search patreon.com slash Savannah Underground. So head over to our page and join us for bonus content, merch drops, live investigations of haunted locations, and just getting to know us, because we really want to get to know you. Enjoy the episode and stay spooky, y'all. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Most Haunted City on Earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we have a wonderful guest today, my best friend, Kristen Osborne. Hello. And uh, Kristen actually works in a extremely haunted building. Uh, it's called the Escape Company. It's over on City Market. So uh, we wanted to bring Kristen on for today because the Escape Company actually used to do a experience with the Gribble House. They did a, like a little mini escape room. So we're going to talk about the Gribble House. We'll talk about some of Kristen's experiences at the escape company. So also, Kristen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello. My name is Kristen Osborne, just like Madison said. Perfect. (laughs) All right. Well, um, so let's go ahead and dive right into it. Um, Let's talk about what the Gribble House kind of was. So there's a lot to unpack with this story. (laughs) Um, but the Gribble House was located over on West Perry Street. It's no longer standing, unfortunately. But it ha- the crime happened on December 10th, 1909. And so this would happen to three women who were living together. And it was a mother and daughter. So the daughter was Carrie, and she was living with her elderly mother, Eliza. And then there was a woman who was renting a room from her uh, from the two women, and that was a woman named Maggie Hunter. Maggie Hunter was kind of a woman who was on the run from her abusive husband and things like that. But to kind of give you the gist of it, essentially, the morning of December 10th, 1909, these three women were attacked in their home by kind of an unknown assailant with an axe. And so Carrie was said to be beaten the worst out of the three because she was trying to defend her mother, um, but she was also partially deaf herself, so she was kind of taken off guard. But she was beaten and had to stay in a slit throat. Eliza was found sitting in a chair in the back bedroom with um, her the back of her skull beaten in. And then Maggie actually was alive when the police arrived. She had also sustained a slit throat. She had also been beaten, but she actually lived for three days after the attack. Oh, yeah. So after the attack, um, the police were kind of, you know, suspicious. They actually thought it was an African-American crime. They ended up investigating 140 African-American men for this crime. But Maggie, right before she died, she was talking to a priest who was kind of, you know, doing his thing, helping her, um, because it was very apparent she was going to pass. And she said that it was her husband who had committed the crime. So there was another issue, too, where the murder weapon was never found, and there were no other witnesses. So it was kind of confusing for them, because they're like, okay, well, we can bring in, you know, Maggie's husband for, you know, uh, investigation. There were other two other men they were also investigating, but they actually went to Maggie's husband's house and found blood-stained cloth stuffed into his fireplace. And that was what got him arrested for these crimes and put on trial. He ended up getting the death penalty, but the day before he was supposed to be executed, it got changed, and he was actually just given a life sentence. But then he ended up getting released about 12 years after and so there are some theories as to if this is why the women are still oh, so sure. present. So 
that's kind of the the nitty gritty of a very <laughs> you know uh, extensive story. But it is an insane story. It is an axe murder. I mean, legitimate axe murdering, which just sounds sensational. You know, that's that that's some headline grabber right there, axe murderer, and uh, in it. It's so indelible that there was a period of time when people didn't talk about the Gribble House at all, but people knew the story. They didn't even know that it was called the Gribble House. They just knew of the three women who were axe murdered in a generalized area. Um, You know, uh, the Gribble House did get a resurgence with the interest in ghost stories and ghost, you know, uh, tours and things of that nature. I remember in the mid 90s, I had a friend who used to work at the Civic Center. And the Civic Center faces, is like right across the street from where the Gribble House stood. And he used to say late at night when he was coming, especially in the winter months, when he was coming to his car, he would hear a woman screaming. And he would, oh, you know, the first few times he heard it, he immediately was like, something is terribly wrong. But he said it became such a normal thing that he almost felt like he could set his watch to it. You know, if he was working late and it was cold outside, that walk to his car. You'd hear a lady scream. You'd hear a lady scream. You'd hear that lady scream. Which Do you have experience with a screaming lady? <laughs> I mean, oh gosh, I'm trying to think. I, I don't think about a screaming lady, no. Uh, a lot of things, it's it's not um, things that I've heard. A lot of it is just random things that I've seen. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of times, I feel like, you know, Madison, you talk about this a lot with guests on here about if you're sensitive or not. And um, I would probably like to say I'm maybe just... Maybe slightly sensitive, sure. semi-sensitive, if you will. Um, a touch. A touch of sensitivity <laughs> in me. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of times it's really been mainly seeing a couple of things, not so much just hearing it. And sometimes, you know, you just wonder if it's a trick of the eye, but then... And is this at uh, the... Escape room. Escape room? Yeah, Which yeah. Which we should tell uh, the listeners that... The, the escape room that we're speaking of is right at the corner of City Market. It is uh, a, a widely and very vastly haunted area for a variety mm-hmm. of reasons. And the specific building that uh, this this escape room is in has a very sordid history with a very specific ghost. And, uh, and we'll get into that. Uh, I'd like to hear your experiences first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I will say, um, you know, the building that... Um, we work in is definitely um, inhabited by some spirits for sure. I think a lot of times it's passing spirits, but then there are a couple of spirits that we believe to be there uh, pretty regularly. And uh, there was actually a medium who came in to um, our company once and, you know, did a little bit of a reading for the owners back in the very beginning um, that explained about, um, two specific spirits, a ghost named David. Um, and he was a friendly, he's a friendly spirit. And, um, then there was a little girl didn't catch the name of her. Um, but the experience, the main experience that I had was a very interesting one. Um, and this was a couple of years ago, late on a Sunday night when just me and two other coworkers are there at the building and it's a slow night. No one else is there. Um, we're just kind of doing some cleaning up and restocking of some things. And basically I had a, a male and a female coworker with me that day. And I was with my female coworker in the other room, our male coworker. We didn't really know where he was. And I came out of the back room and I came down the hallway where you can kind of look back to where our control room is and down that hallway I'm carrying some stuff so I'm not paying like super close attention but I looking down the hall I see a guy in a trench coat just like go right around the corner into our control room and I was like oh odd um, don't know what that is. And I automatically started assuming it was my male coworker playing a trick on us because he really liked to grab the trench coat in one of our escape rooms that we have actually. So I very well was like, oh, okay, that's, that's him. So I run into the back and I'm like, Hey man, what are you doing in there doing this to us? And there's no one in there. So I was like, okay, well, that's, that's different. So I backed out, 
went back to my coworker and I was like, hey, where's our, uh, where's our buddy? And she's like, I don't know. I think he's in the bathroom right now. And I was like, okay. I saw something kind of weird. Um, and then she ends up going out the door. She uh, it got a little antsy and everything. She starts walking out the door with some more items, and I watch her stop dead in her tracks in the hallway and just kind of backtrack back into the room with me. And she was shaking her head, and I said, what? And she said, I just saw it too. She saw the same kind of thing, like a, guy, like, a, like a man just kind of like coming around the corner or whatever in a trench coat. And so finally we find my other coworker, and he had been in the restroom the whole time, so it was not him. And he explained to us that, and we said, okay, we think we're seeing David tonight. Um, and so we were like, okay, interesting. Let's go ahead and just wrap on up and get out of here because it's time for closing up anyway. Let's just go ahead and go out the back door and just not think about it again. And as we are turning out the lights and getting ready to leave, um, the coworker of mine who hadn't, you know, experienced this yet was in the back, he was behind us all, and he, um, as he's going, you know, through the doorway and shutting it behind us and everything, he looks down the hallway, and he sees a man standing at the end of the hallway, just staring at us, walking through the door and leaving. Old David. Old David. (laughs) Tell you, that guy, he, like, usually... It's so interesting because usually it's something small like opening doors or, um, you know, just little things here and there. And there's not been a whole lot of actual sightings, but this was like a very different occurrence where we did finally see something. And we're, we're a little uncertain still yet, even if that was actually David or not, because we were told he was such a friendly spirit. And after that, we started feeling like just a bunch of negativity there, weirder stuff. So almost even think that it could have not been David. It could have been another passing spirit. Well, didn't that building used to hold gunpowder? And wasn't there like an explosion or something that occurred there? So fascinatingly, that building, yes, uh, was a powder magazine, but it was also a brothel. Ah, Yeah, okay. And in... um, when I first moved here, there was a restaurant where this um, escape room is on the, on the ground level. Uh, it was called 606 East Cafe, and one of my favorite restaurants, but it, it was besieged by a, a, a persistent ghost story, and it, it, was, it was a woman that um, there's a long mirror down the hallway to the bathroom. So as you're leaving the bathroom, you're facing a walled mirror, and people would come out and see in the reflection of the mirror somebody in the hall and they usually would typify it as this woman in, like, Victorian-era clothing. And they would turn, and she wouldn't be there. And they'd look in the mirror. And this was a common thing. And uh, I, I spoke to a, a, a purported medium who said that it was a brothel at one point and that a woman was actually murdered there. She was beaten to death with a um, lantern. The lantern set fire to the building. There was a huge fil- fire in the building. Um, and so oh, wow. it, it was interesting because after the fact, I realized that I had heard stories of people having smoke, and I always thought it was the gunpowder, was people talking about fire and smoke because apparently it, when it was a gunpowder magazine, yeah. it, it blew up. Yeah. Um, prompting them to move their gunpowder magazine out into the woods, like far away. It was a trek. Right now it's out on 17. You can still visit that powder magazine that's out there. <laughs> it's this big brick structure. Um, but they moved it away from the city because <laughs> the city was very flammable <laughs> yeah. and it was very dangerous to have these these explosives. But, you know, you're right on the very uh, corner, technically the outskirts of City Market, mm-hmm. and City Market being a place where slaves were sold, where goods were sold, where people came from all over the world to make deals, and then you'd have all these sailors looking for a good time. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, that whole area... You always hear, oh, this used to be a brothel. That used to be a brothel. This is a brothel. Um, so that was, uh, that was a common business in that area, uh, according to legend. 
you know, uh, there were no business books to, <laughs> it's like, um, brothel, brothel, brothel. Okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> you know, no, one, no one was like reporting no one, it on their taxes. Yes. No <laughs> you, one, you mean to tell me no one kept record of all their brothels in town? I, it's very odd, but uh, I think that they, they probably coincided with the slave trade mm-hmm. as well. You know, it was probably a, a side hustle. Human trafficking is human trafficking. The, um, that's interesting that it was just like a man in a trench coat. It could have been very well David, but it also, like Chris is saying, since it was a brothel, it very well could have been just like a John that's still residual, you know. Well, um, especially given the negative sensations that you're feeling, there, it could have been any number of disgruntled human beings yeah oh yeah because it's it's very interesting you know there's been some just very small experiences for the most part that I've had there but then you know we've had a couple of even more interesting experiences too with stuff like there was there was another instance I think this one actually this one could be debunked with gravity to be fair but there was we used to have this big antique mirror sitting on a ledge (laughs) yeah on a ledge. I mean, not a great idea. But it, at one point, I think it was hung. Uh, but at this point, it was kind of just like sitting on the ledge and whatnot. And it had been there for years. Like, never moved. And all of a sudden, one day, as my boss and coworker are walking by it, we got it on security camera footage and everything. As they're walking by, that mirror just falls over and shatters on the floor. Oof. Yeah. Like... Very interestingly. However, um, we, we did kind of look and see about debunking that one of, like, you know, we think somebody, like, kind of hit the ledge a little bit and it was just right. So that one, eh, we'll see. One of the most interesting debunking methods is to explain it through those those means. It's like, oh, well, the air can move this door. Oh, well, it would be very easy because this thing is on the edge. But truth be told, ghosts are not particularly beefy. You know, they don't have a lot of muscle. So... It would make sense that they would go to move the thing that's easiest to move. Yes. So if the opportunity to move something's there without expending huge amounts of energy, they may very well take that opportunity. Mm-hmm. And let's not even begin to talk about what a broken mirror indicates spirit-wise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the release into this world from a broken mirror, widely believed by many cultures, um, the idea that you break a mirror and the spirit inside the mirror gets out. And, you know, uh, we typify it as seven years of bad luck. But it's seven years of good luck for the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> the spirit's like, hoorah! Yes. I'm free. I'm free. So, um, yeah, no, uh, I, 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 would not, I would not quickly scoff at antique mirrors falling down and breaking. Um, no, not too quickly, no. Definitely did not. We, um, it, was, it was definitely a very, a very strange one. Um, but, yeah, it was really interesting. We... Um, there was, I think there was another instance with somebody else who, um, you know, we have a bar down there in this escape room, and it's got, um, you know, we have one of the soda guns and everything. So in our, we have a cabinet that we keep all of these um, containers in that hold, like, all of the sodas and stuff like that. And they're pretty heavy, and they're big, large boxes, and they sit up on a shelf. It's really awful to try to restock these things, too, because they're, you know, you just like put them over your head. And um, there was one day where um, this also got caught on some security camera footage. Um, a coworker of mine is behind the bar with some customers um, up front and everything, and one of the boxes just comes flying out of the cabinet. Oof. It's full. It's not like an empty one, and yeah, that one was very, very creepy. Yeah, you, you really start hedging your bets when you start dealing with entities that have any physical force, any physical ability. That is, that is definitely walking into dangerous territory because in order for a spirit to have effect on the physical world, that means they have to have some form of force here. And any force they use to move an object is the same force they can apply to you, you know, physical force. And you hear about it, people getting scratched, people getting pushed, that sensation of something physical happening. And to me, f- physical manifestations are a step dang- more dangerous than visual or audio. You know, once something starts moving, now you're dealing with, a, with an entity that's going to expend energy and, and a massive amount. 
I mean, imagine like trying to move a giant thing with your breath. You know, <laughs> imagine sure. trying to trying to blow on a box to make it move, um, because technically most most spirits, in order to manifest the energy to move, have to have a massive amount of energy, which makes which makes them. And I I will use the word dangerous, which which definitely makes them more present threat than something that's going to jump out and be like boogity boogity. So. To bring it back, actually, to the Gribble House, the I used to work for the company that owns the building that is now where the Gribble House stood. And so a lot of times, the people who work in that building, you know, they aren't very aware of history because they, they don't need to. They're not usually tour guides or people who, you know, are super big. Like a hist- garage. Yeah, it's, it's a car barn. It's, you know, it's meant for mechanics and trolleys. So um, at Christmas time, they run the Christmas tour out of there. Now, I worked the night of the anniversary of the Gribble House murders, and nobody else acknowledged that particular incident at all. Um, so I, I, because I was managing that Christmas tour because it was off season for ghosts and stuff like that. So I would be in there oftentimes alone for extended periods of time. And I kind of got to know Maggie Hunter a little bit. She's probably the most prominent spirit on that property. She hangs out in kind of this metal gated off area. Um, and so she usually is pretty harmless, to be quite honest, uh, for dying in such a dramatic way. And maybe it's just because I'm a woman and she's like, cool, you're, you're good. You know, she didn't really bother me. She, you know, sometimes messed with my, my phone that I was connecting the Christmas music to, but I don't blame her. It was very obnoxious. So, <laughs> you know, but the odd thing was, was I was the only one who acknowledged that anniversary. Nobody else did. And the next morning, um, well, I shouldn't say morning because I came in in the afternoon to get everything set up. And her gate would have this solid metal lock on it that I had to put on every single night. And it was completely broken when I came in. And I'm like, that's weird. Broken? Yeah, it was literally broken like somebody snapped it. But it was solid metal. And so I'm like, how, how did that happen? So I started asking, you know, some of the mechanics and guys who come in, you know, to set things up with me and whatnot. And I'm like, hey, did you notice anything else that's, like, broken? Like, this, like, lock, this, this lock, here it is. You know, it is, it looks like it was mangled. And they're like, that's weird, you know. No, nobody was in here last night. Everything was locked up. You set the security alarm, right? And I was like, yep, set it. Everything was good. They're like, well, nothing was tripped. There's no other sign of damage in the building. I was like, I wonder if that's Maggie just making her, you know, presence acknowledging, you know, like, hey, y'all, bad things have happened on this property and nobody cares, it seems like. And so a lot of times when spirits have that very deep trauma from their life, sometimes when anniversaries come about, they just feel disrespected if, you know, you're just going about your normal life. Well, what really kind of chills me is the fact that if you look up the Gribble House murders, um, the descriptions of the injuries do not sound like he hacked them with the edge of the axe. It sounds like he was using the blunt end, Mm -hmm. the back end, to To bash them, to, you know, because the descriptions are not hack marks or cuts, they are bludgeoned. He, they were bludgeoned. And, and that led me to think this person is just using raw rage and energy, not, you know, it's hard to survive a hit <laughs> from the axe like this, but he, he obviously repeatedly hit um, two of the victims. Uh, and, it, and, and, and that brings you to this idea of taking an axe, you know, the back of an axe and taking it to one of those locks, you can knock it right off of its, you know, pins, um, which kind of chilling to think about on the mm. anniversary of a man who repeatedly bashed somebody with a heavy object. Yeah. Well, especially because it was found out that it was Maggie's husband and she was the reason why he showed up. So yeah, if she was staying behind a locked cage that for is, that very purpose, you know, that it's, is it's intriguing. Oh, it is wow. intriguing. 
And and we discussed earlier that we're dealing with um, an injustice. The victims were not given justice. He was not punished to the expectations of everyone what he deserved to be punished as. So now we're dealing with spirits that are probably restless at the lack of justice. And their discomfort, their, their anguish could very well keep him from passing on, you know, keep him. Like when he died, they probably drew him back to the scene of the crime and make him live it over and over again just as a measure of justice. Um, so that's an interesting, that's very interesting. Now, Kristen, I do want to ask. So when you guys were running that small little experience with the Gribble House, did you ever get like any activity that was in that room in particular because of the violent nature of the whole thing where they're trying to find an axe for that's the murder weapon or whatever. Did you ever get any kind of activity? Um, honestly, I can't say that we specifically did with that one um, because of the fact that the, um, we called it the trolley room because sure. um, we had guests that would come down for this five minute immersive experience of doing um a five minute long escape room um based on the triple axe murders and so the room was interesting it's um you know it spread kind of long and it was divided into three sections and we would put people in three sections and they had to work um to try to find the axe first and so there were three axes hidden that they tried to have to find. Um, and every once in a while, I it, it, the room didn't feel great sometimes, but that's um, that's where I go back to you know those other spirits too. You know we have so many floating spirits through there, so we very well could have had some residual effects from um, you know the Gribble House murders and everything, and basing it that room off of it um but also you know the the ghosts that you know we typically encounter down there uh and everything we he typically he typically hides out in one escape room towards one escape room our um our csi room and um that's the one that usually people have the most um, experiences with. Would you say that you've seen him before the Gribble House experience went up, or would you say you saw him after the Gribble House experience went up? Ah, so interesting enough, uh, that would have been while the Gribble House experience was still up. So, and the reason I ask is, uh, there's something very interesting about haunted locations, and that is, and I'll say it probably many times in the podcast, uh, people are more likely to be haunted than houses. People will bring spirits with them. They'll, they'll cling to them and they'll walk around and there'll be spirits following them. Like oftentimes many spirits will be following a single person. And if you go to a place that has a high enough energy that the spirit can feel comfortable, competent, even you know powerful, that spirit may detach from the person and take up residence in the new place where the energy is you know very... Um, conclusive, conducive, excuse me, conducive to their existence. The spirit gets to a place and there's a smorgasbord of energy. It's like, later, I'm just going to be here. Um, and I think that happens in Savannah a lot. Mm-hmm. I think people come here with spirits mm-hmm. and leave without them. I think that uh, a lot of ghosts that, that we commonly experience may not even be a Savannah-based ghost. Mm-hmm. It may very well just be a very powerful entity that found a home here. Uh, and if you know anybody who's moved to Savannah, you've probably heard the story of, I came to Savannah and I just loved it. You know, I just, I, and, and, and I, so I, I moved here. I think that happens with ghosts. I think the ghosts come here and they're like, ah, I just love it. I'm just, I'm just going to move here. I'm just going to live right here in this little dark corner. Like, so, um, it's yeah. the hostess city. It is the hostess city. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. So I actually have another question too. So would you say, because you lived in West Virginia, you know, which is full of all the Appalachian lore and things like that, and oh, yeah. I wonder, have you ever, did you find that you had more experiences when you moved to Savannah than you did in West Virginia, or did you, you know, have some experience while you were still living there? So I've had a couple of experiences uh, back home even, not quite um I will say my my experiences have been kind of um spread far apart 
Um, you know, every once in a while I'll feel some things and m- m- maybe hear some stuff even, but it's not always super often that I'm seeing stuff. Um, but I remember one of the first things um, that I heard and experienced back when I was young is I, um, I went to this K through eight school. So I grew up in this school basically. And we, it was um, an old building also that was built back in probably like the 1940s, 1950s. And uh, even like half of my, t- my teachers went to that school while they were growing up and everything. There was, um, you know, always talk about Athens being haunted. And um, there was one time I remember I was pretty young. I was in the gymnasium and I was getting ready. Uh, Something happened, I guess. And I was like sitting in the hallway where the bathroom was. And you could kind of like see down into the hallway and go around the corner. And that's where the bathroom would be. And I remember I was sitting there. I was, I thought I heard um, somebody say my name from the bathroom and I saw some shadows, like, like shadows of girls in the bathroom or something. And I was like, well, hello, who's there? And I heard nothing. And then the, the shadows kind of moved, like they were going around the corner or disappeared or something. And I went on down around the corner, went into the bathroom. There was no one in there. This, <laughs> this concept of the Appalachian... Um, Calling out your name. Calling out your name. It, it's haunting us, quite yes. literally, because yes. it, it seems to come up every time. And I think just because we're so close, uh, close to Appalachia, yeah, you know. Yeah. JT, put that down in the books. Must go to Appalachia. And, yes. Yeah. Got it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so we've, we've talked a little bit about that, where, you know, there's so many people who report hearing, you know, something calling out their name or whatever, and that's usually some kind of spirit that's trying to get your attention and usually not for a good thing and it's interesting that that happened to you as a child because that's something we also talk about you know where children are the most susceptible to evil or malicious spirits because you're so vulnerable and so innocent and if it knows your name then it already has power over you in some capacities because names hold so much weight with your connection with that spirit And that's why, you know, when you know a demon's name, it's it helps so much in trying to get rid of it. So it's equal parts good and bad. Yeah. (laughs) Because speaking the name is evocation, but also dominion. It's it's a it's a dangerous game. And names are dangerous games. You know, uh, I think that we're just coming into an interesting time where many of us are known by our pseudonyms, by our screen names, by these other names, which was a pretty good practice to have. You know, don't let just anybody know your name because they could use it against you. That's how they they bind spells. There are a lot of Mm -hmm. spells where you have to repeat the person's name while you're doing something in order to affect that person. So if you're hiding your name, and I want to say that in a lot of um, voodoo priests will use these elaborate names as protection from other people stealing their juju or stealing their, you know, uh, their abilities or cursing them. So, yeah, I think uh, when you hear your name called out, nine times out of ten is not great. You know, nine times out of ten, it, it's something uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, that one time out of ten is probably a loved one, you know, saying, Hello. hey, how's it going? The, <laughs> but uh, usually they won't make you feel oogity boogity. Yeah. Very true. The... Uh, it's interesting that you bring up bringing, um, creating a different name. That that was such a common practice in old witchcraft is that you had your witch's name right. that was either given to you or, I mean, you could theoretically come up with one yourself and that makes it even easier to, you know, conceal your name because only you know it at that point and only you know that this isn't your actual name. Right. But so many people used to do that to keep, you know, all those hexes from coming to them, or even just, like, the more mythical spirits, the fae, the leprechauns, the um, spirits they didn't want to encounter. It, it, like I've said before, it really shows up in fae because fae are notorious for using your name against you. So... Absolutely. Yeah. 
But you said that it was, you saw like outlines of little girls almost. Well, I thought, you know, I thought it was like classmates is what I automatically assumed because I saw shadows of like female figures down there. Wasn't sure if they were older or younger exactly. Um, This was also like so long ago. And I'm trying to like piece together this memory again because it, it felt like probably some classmates that were around my age. So they would have been younger. And yeah, they just... That's pretty classic. Kristen. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the thing that's, that's alarming is that you saw multiple shadows. You know, that, uh, mm-hmm. that, that is alarming. Because you know, usually yeah. it's a single entity. It usually it's a, a single shadow. And, but having multiple figures yeah. denotes a kind of uh, colony that you stumbled into. Stumbled along a ghost colony in the ladies' room, I swear. And we were talking about bathrooms yeah. being incredibly scary places and uh and and there are cultures that have specific bathroom ghosts the one that sticks out in my mind is the japanese schoolgirl uh toilet ghost uh <laughs> which it's terrifying because i and for me i'm i'm phobic of bathrooms as it is so when you're like oh and there's a ghost in there it's like well i i'm having enough trouble already <laughs> I, don't, I don't need the addition of a of a demon ghost hanging out in the bathroom it's or scary. it's just moaning myrtle you know yeah. well see Aww. it's I was not a fan of Moni Myrtle because she's a bathroom ghost. She <laughs> is. <laughs> like, no, bathroom ghost, no. Well, and she actually is pretty accurate um, to how bathroom ghosts operate is they intrude on your privacy. I mean, <laughs> that is... the most private well, place. Well, you know, be. like... She really invaded yeah. privacy. Well, I mean, like, in the books, literally, uh, it's so interesting because she... It, it, she's very different in the films. In the books, there's, like, this one scene where Harry's taking a bath in the prefect um, bathroom, and it's kind of this open space of a large tub. She gets into the water with him, and she watches him naked, like, you know, in this, and while he's, you know, trying to figure out the golden egg right. thing and whatnot. And she's in love with him. And I'm like, there are so many levels to <laughs> this. So you many know. levels of wrong just yeah. happening right here. Which, I mean, there are spirits that will claim that they're in love with the living or, you know, will intrude on your privacy in that way. And those are ones that are and sometimes the most frightening. You know, you've heard, and because it's a good comedy trope whenever you have, like, comedy ghosts or comedy things, and I, I'm not, I, it, it may have been Chris Rock and Dogma talking about the dead, you know, are all around and, oh, what do they do? Well, mostly watch a shower. You know? <laughs> and, and I was like, that's fair. You know, I, I, I can see the, the line of thought there is, you know, and that's a place that we don't get to go. You know, it's yeah. not a group activity. So, yeah. yeah. That is true. But, yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting concept, though. And I wonder if... Maybe in Edinburgh, where J.K. Rowling um, wrote all this. I mean, I went there, and it's a very haunted city. Oh, sure. So, you know, I wonder if they have this influx of spirits that romanticize humans, you know, and maybe... I would think so. I mean, I think that... Uh, I, and I say it all the time, that love is probably the, the strongest spiritual connector, and the most likely reason to experience a ghost is because it is a loved one who passed trying to communicate the love they had for you. So with that in mind, I think that uh, the romanticized version of human dead relations is exponentially more the older a civilization is. You know, the older the civilization is, the, the, there is a, oh, you know, you, you, you died before your love, you know, and, and then what happens? It's like, well, your love mourns, but they see you every day. You know, it's, it's a part of that experience. And I think that ghosts were much more regularly accepted without there being a, a very big scare factor for a long time. There's a long time when it was just normal. You know, you take Shakespeare's ghosts. If the ghost shows up in Shakespeare, they were, ah, but oh, yeah, not normal. You know, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what happens. And uh, it was common enough for them to address it in at least two plays where people encounter ghosts, and they take it very, like, oh, oh okay, well, this, this, this is happening now, and we have to do something about it. Um, well, yeah. it, it's interesting that you bring up that, like, you know, a lot of times people think ghosts have to be scary looking. Mm. There is a really interesting concept of what we believe 
every entity to look like. We always think like demons are ugly and scary and angels are beautiful and gorgeous and have long flowing golden locks or whatever. That is not the case at all. Actually, angels themselves are a frightening thing. Be to, not afraid. Exactly. <laughs> like in the Bible where they they often say like do not be afraid like stop having a panic attack essentially (laughs) there's a reason to say be not afraid (laughs) yeah and so it's because they're so abnormal looking and they often have to transform themselves into something that we mortals can actually Mm -hmm. comprehend right but there's also demons that are beautiful and that's what attracts you you know the most beautiful of angels yeah You know, know, it's um, I find it interesting that we've created this imagery of what we believe. And and, and that fascinatingly plays into the Indonesian ghosts that we were talking about, how they, it is all about a physicality that you recognize them as. Um, We are very tied to making a form for our ghosts. Mm -hmm. We're very tied to like making the shape that we would pass on to the next person. It's like, oh, it was, you know, a woman in white and long black hair and her Mm -hmm. eyes were dark. And and the fact that we can describe ghosts so readily and fully speaks to the tradition of ghost stories. You know, we start to recognize them. You know, chains. Chains on a ghost are such a common thing throughout Mm -hmm. history but the question was, why? <laughs> you know, uh, what, what yes. makes the chain? Well, it turns out that sometimes they would bind bodies with chains in lieu of casket, oh. and the chain would keep the body from sifting through the ground. You know, and a lot of times you see the common ghost being a sheet. Well, we used to wrap bodies in sheets. In many cultures, we still do wrap bodies in sheets, the shroud. And the shroud that we wrapped them in, sometimes we'd wrap a chain around it all, put it in a hole, and there you had the last time we saw the body... It was in a white sheet with chains. And then, surprise, you're haunted by what? Something that looks like white sheets rattling chains. A white sheet chain ghost. White sheet chain ghost. Yes. yes. So you mentioned that in the escape room, there's a lot of transient spirits. Um, so for uh, those of you who don't know what a transient spirit is, it's basically a homeless ghost. Yep. Um, and there's lots of reasons why they show up and why they want to be wherever it is that they are. But... Do you have any ones that, like, you've noted in particular that you've seen or, you know? Yeah, so, um, like, like I said, the, the one that we at least mistook or thought was David that maybe was not, um, that one, because that one seemed to bring forth more of a negative energy, um, some of that negative energy kind of ebbed and flowed in there like it would come and it would be there for a while then it was gone and (coughs) then maybe it would come back again for a little bit and then it was gone um so there was there there was that and then um I'm trying to think Uh, you know funny enough actually we um we have our own bathroom ghost at escape (laughs) (laughs) um so anyway the um the bathroom ghost that we have, the little girl I was mentioning earlier, um, alongside of David, um, the little girl ghost apparently likes to play tricks on people in the bathroom. Um, now, I, we all haven't kind of heard any record of her in quite some time, but in the beginning, she was more present and prominent there. Um, there was, I think, a time where a co-worker of mine went into the ladies' room, was trying to go to the bathroom and open one of the stalls, and she pushed on the stall door to go in, and it was opening, but then it shut back immediately. And she was like, oh, okay, someone must be in there. And she, like, looked under, and there's no one in there, so then she Pushed it open again, and it actually opened, and so that was a little bit of a freaky one for her in there. Um, and so I guess there was a couple of other people, like maybe even some guests, who mentioned something about like little girl laughing in the bathroom, but there was no little girl in the building. A lot of times, um, children spirits. They, they are rambunctious like that. And they're actually more up to be a transient spirit, in my opinion. Because, oh, absolutely. They don't have any ties. They yeah, they're you know, more curious anyways, right. you know. And, so they can explore. Yeah. So I could totally believe that there being no record of, you know, 
a little girl being in the building, but she's like, oh, lots of people in here. <laughs> you know, I can play tricks on them. Yeah. But yeah, I think she was more prominent back in the beginning, and then maybe she, you know, passed on to somewhere else. Sure. And sure. actually in the building that the Gribble House was in, there was some really interesting spirits like that too, where... Well, you're talking about ground zero for hyper-spiritual activity. You know, whenever something happens at such a high emotional stake, such as, you know, a murder being almost like an instant, you know, get a ghost-free card. You know, if a place had a murder, that means that the intent to take someone's life was there, the loss of a life was there, all this emotional input. And so the Gribble House, three murders occurred in a very short period of time. You know, the action, the violent act was very quick. You know, it happened that morning and he was, you know, it was discovered like, you know, yeah. the morning that it happened. So we're, we're, we're definitely dealing with this high emotional output. But I always talk about the Gribble House because it, it is in an interesting location on top of everything else. It is right across from the Savannah Redoubt. It is where mm-hmm. during the Siege of Savannah, the, uh, the forces, the British forces were lined up right where the Gribble House was. Their wounded died there. The, 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 the sounds of war, the sounds of people dying, whatever pressure was ha- coming from outside of Savannah in, all happened along that line. You know, they were defending the high ground, which is right where the Gribble House is. And then the redoubt was like a, a, a hill that went down towards a tributary, a little creek. And that was a huge battlefield. So on top of this triple homicide in 1909, you had this 1780s battle that was a battle royale. It was, yeah. it was a really bloody feat. So um, I know I've, I've had people right on the corner, behind the Gribble House, right on the corner of uh, Liberty and uh, MLK, hear the sounds of screams, gunfire, um, and of course, it's Savannah, so I, gunfire yeah. may not be. You know. I was, was going to say MLK at night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gun, gun, gunfire may not be musket fire. It, uh, but hearing battle, hearing the sounds of battle and the screams and the cries, and if you're if you're standing at that intersection, you're between the Gribble House and a battlefield. Yeah. So the, the likelihood of having, at the very least, an uneasy feeling is pretty good. Um, and it's funny because mm-hmm. not many walking tours can make it that far west or north, <laughs> mm-hmm. to, to accommodate the Gribble House. So, you know, when people come to Savannah and they're like, oh, where's the Gribble House? They're kind of surprised to see that it's, it's away from, like, the, the heart of downtown. It's, it's right on the edge, the western edge of mm-hmm. downtown, right mm-hmm. by the Savannah Civic Center, which brings or brought thousands of people, thousands of, 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 of bodies of energy moving around to see shows, to do these things. We talk about theaters being haunted. That whole place has that vibe. It's like, oh, this is perfect for haunting. You know, this, this, if, if you needed all the ingredients to haunt a place, uh, you know, triple homicide, you know, a, a, a theater right across the street, a yes. battlefield on the other side, you're, you're really hedging your bets. You're going, you're, oh, yeah. you're, you're, you're going to have an experience. So it's actually um, funny. There is a couple soldier spirits that are in that building. Oh, yeah. Um, and so one of them hangs out in this kind of back, like, room. It's, you know, it's interesting because he hates women, which is intriguing Mm. because of the three women that reside there as the global house women. Yeah. um, I realized that when I was first getting trained in that building for the Christmas tour. And so the guy who was training me, he's like, oh, don't go into that back room. And I was like, oh, why is there, you know, like, is something wrong with it? And he's like, oh, no, it's just there's a... Um, a soldier spirit that's back there, and he doesn't like women. Interesting. Yeah. There was another woman who used to work there, and she was the one who found out that he didn't like women oh, no. um, because she went in there and immediately saw this man in his soldier's uniform, more than likely from the siege, and he immediately slammed the door shut, screamed, and charged at her. And so she was like, yeah, he didn't like me. And I was like, well, that's intriguing because he didn't die by the hands of the woman. But maybe he just doesn't like the Gribble House women. He's tired of them or something. And something. He's- and it's interesting because, um, and we don't, we don't really talk about this in Savannah lore, but during the, um, during the American Revolution, we had a lot of Hessian soldiers. Yeah. And Hessians were professional soldiers. They were, you know, uh, they were the scariest, of, uh, the headless horsemen. Uh, of fame was a Hessian 
hired out by the English to fight these kind of mercenary tactics. And they were known for being bloodthirsty and they're known for being war hungry. And I wonder if that isn't a part of that. I wonder if that wasn't a Hessian That's- who, who would be incensed by, well, actually any life, but women, I think, probably in the case of a Hessian soldier may not have been a high priority on the battlefield. You know? Yeah. So, so yeah. because it was about um, terror, you know, Hessians left a, 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 a terror behind and people were just so afraid of them. Um, you know, the classic story of, of the, uh, the Hessians uh, sharpening their teeth, filing them mm-hmm. to give them a more fierce look. And so I think that, yeah, that would be interesting. I, I'd never heard of a soldier in, in the Gribble House. This is like a very, like, it, it's a very unknown thing because it only happened to the guy who trained me and the woman who was, <laughs> you know. That's very interesting, yeah. too. Yeah, you know, it's it, yeah, because a lot of people want there to be like Civil War ghosts. Uh, and so there's a lot of talk about Civil War ghosts. But we didn't experience any battles in Savannah proper, hardly at all. So in Savannah, we don't have like a, a, a Civil War battlefield. Um, Savannah surrendered very Right, like off the top, yeah. we, we sent a writer out yeah. to Sherman and was like, hey, 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 before Hold you up. burn all this down, <laughs> have some shadow artillery punch and let's, <laughs> let's party. <laughs> so, uh, so Sherman did not burn down Savannah, nor was there a conflict for Savannah. Um, any, any soldiers generally are either the wounded of the Civil War or the Battle of Savannah. Yeah, I mean, we did have hospitals and sorts oh, yeah. like Absolutely. that, you know. The Marshall House famously was a hospital. Um, even where the Kendler Hospital was, they had an encampment hospital there. So, um, and I want to say that the encampment hospital was like Confederate. And then when they, the Union finally like got in, they were like, they just switched it out. They like pulled all the Confederate soldiers out and put all the Union soldiers mm-hmm. in. So the Confederate soldiers lost all their, their good care. Yeah, we do have also a lot of our Siege of Savannah soldiers because of the burial practices right. of war. And it's very possible, too, that where the Gribble House is standing could be right next to where yeah, one of the, the, yeah, the trenches, if right. you will, that they dug and would just dump bodies into it. Well, that's so. the story of the Sorrel Weed House. Mm-hmm. Sorrel Weed House says that it, that it was one of the trench lines and that many bodies were discovered because they find like um, belts and, and buttons and bayonets. Yeah, the reason why those trenches existed was because during the siege of Savannah, I think the number that's kind of been tossed around now of how many dead there were was around 1,200. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you have a battle of that nature and you have 1,200 people you got to dispose of, you don't have the time to pick every single body up and give them a proper Victorian funeral or, um, you know, that would have been colonial. But regardless, it's still a very, very extensive funeral process. They, they just wanted to get rid of you as quickly as possible so that they could continue forward. So they dug these big trenches and they essentially just rolled the bodies in and mm-hmm. covered it up and created mass graves. And a lot of times over on the west side of Savannah, that's where you're seeing these trenches, which is why the Sorrel Weed House, you know. Well, we are very close to it. Like, oh, just yeah. over the way is, is, yeah. is the tributary, the creek that I was talking about. And they said that that cl- creek was dammed up with bodies. Like, the bodies were, were in the creek. And for a time, they were just kind of floating down the way. But then they just dammed up the creek because there were so many. And that was literally, like, right there. That's well, yeah. Great. I mean, the Spring Hill Redow is literally yeah. right there right, right so right there, yeah. <laughs> right there. Yeah. yeah yeah so it's you know we're, we're in the area of soldiers even in this building we've have heard people say that they've seen soldiers or things like that there is a multitude of things have been seen in here uh, yeah we'll have to do a whole show on this, this honestly building. we really will i mean because there are so many through here so actually Kristen um also is our stage manager for the savannah underground mm-hmm. and so um, it's been funny that since we've started recording this podcast, actually, there has been more activity in this room <laughs> since, um, since before it started. So actually a, a couple, like a week ago, I want to say, there's been reports of seeing things crawling over by that bed over there. And, um, on Saturday, which was August 1st, or no, 
the 30th, the 30th uh, 31st. Yes. Over in that room behind Kristen, there was kind of this shadowy figure hanging out in there, which is yeah. really interesting. I didn't get to see it because I was in the room, but, you know, it's... Yeah. Um, so that was something that we actually saw on the, sec- on the security cameras, um, my, on my cameras in the back. And a couple other people saw different things than I saw. Like, some people saw, like, an actual shadow figure and stuff. I saw, like, a like a like a shadowy blob of something kind of fluttering and moving um it was interesting it was very weird yeah and they're like how did you not see anything madison you always see spheres i'm like it's pitch black in there i'm like i i like listen i could see ghosts but exactly i'm like I can see ghosts, but I don't have night vision. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not extraterrestrial. I so have, it's. I have night vision backstage. Exactly. So that's the only reason we saw it. But yeah, it's it's been interesting to see how many things have started to perk up. Well, and and we we had talked about this on on other podcasts. When when you speak of it, you are opening doors. You are giving light to the idea that we are paying attention, that we are open to the idea that, you know, our own perceptions are becoming wider by discussing it. And that makes it fertile ground for the spirit to try to present itself, to try to communicate, you know, uh, to show itself. Because it, it, uh, I, I believe very firmly that ghosts don't want to waste their energy on an endeavor that does not pay them back in attention. Mm-hmm. You know, the exchange is they show themselves and we pay attention. And it's funny that we use the word pay. We pay attention. We give them attention that nourishes them, that gives them form, that gives them purpose and sustenance and connection. So when you're telling stories, when you're sitting around, this is the ghost story, whether those stories are even related at all to who these entities might be, it opens the door. It gives them an opportunity to to say, this is a place of openness. This is a place where people are, are willing to, to, to pay attention. I, since we've started, I, I constantly feel this draw to mm-hmm. this area, you know, yeah, in my, in my, yeah. in my hearing, in my vision, I'm always looking mm-hmm. over here because there's this sensation that just beyond the, the, the area that I can clearly see is something standing, is something waiting. I don't feel any particular threat per se, but I definitely feel mm-hmm. like we are, we are guarded by the halo of this <laughs> light that we're under. Yes. Um, it's funny too, because um, there is this one spirit that I've noted in this area that is what I would classify as a trickster spirit. It is just something, it's a low energy being that will transform itself into whatever you want it to be just so it can get your attention because that's how they feed. Um, Now, what I've noticed it starting to do since we started talking about this and it's starting to pick up on that is that in that bed where um, we've often seen the spirit, that's where we do our hag scene. And the actor who plays the hag, Leafy, he does this very particular movement where he's crawling on all fours and he's very animalistic. And we've seen, in um, uh, quite a few people have reported watching on the cameras while the hag's in bed, seeing this creature like uh, a spirit doing the same types of movements it's mimicking it because it sees the reaction that the audience is giving the hag being like oh my gosh it's so frightening wow that's so creepy and it's like wait i can do that too you know i i can i can move like that i can be creepy i can crawl around the bed but nobody's paying any attention to it Mm -hmm. so i wonder if it'll ever you know although equally we can really freak uh leafy out and ask him whether or not he feels that his portrayal is derived from within him Ooh. or from an entity that is trying to get him puppety like <laughs> is it is it is it informing him of how to move uh, because that's a, that's an interesting actors mm-hmm. acting as a whole has a long history of ghosts lore and ghost history um, and and close proximity to being ghosts because we're reenacting we're we're recreating a life and in that act we are actually like ghosts, we are actually filling in a space as a different person, and I think that is a very attractive thing to go. So, ghosts and actors go way back. You know, the the concept of where is the muse, where is the inspiration? Are you being informed by uh, you know? Because when you speak lines that have been spoken for five hundred years, you are basically stepping into an infinite loop of character. 
you know, I am, because I played Hamlet, I have 500 years of people saying the same words, having the same intent and, and, and emoting the same way. Am I not being a part of, an, of a living thing that, that goes on and on? Hmm. I'm going to ask Leafy. I'm like, hey, Leafy, how's your home life been? Um, <laughs> how are you sleeping? Yeah, you got any uh, sleep paralysis going on? Yeah, exactly. You know, um, it is interesting, though, how many people have reported seeing the same thing with right. sleep paralysis, too. It's like, you know, they all say that it's like this gaunt, stringy-haired thing, you know. And it, it is interesting if maybe over time, because people keep talking about their sleep paralysis experiences, it's starting to morph into other people's sleep well, paralysis. There's a great documentary called The Nightmare. So look up The Nightmare. It is a documentary about sleep paralysis, but it's also a very effective horror movie because it definitely touches upon the sensations, visions, and expectations of people who suffer regularly from sleep paralysis. And that'll be a whole nother episode, I'm sure. (laughs) Um, But with that being said, though, we do need to start wrapping things up. So, uh, Kristen, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you guys for having me. It was a good time. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to plug or anything you want to talk about? Um, Honestly, just, you know... um the, the escape company is a really great place. It's um, super awesome. We have a lot of fun down there. And uh, stop by for a drink or a game sometime. And uh, the ghosts are usually pretty friendly down there. So don't Holy have Ghost to. Tabernacle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Listen to the Holy Ghost Tabernacle Choir, everybody. My soon-to-be husband is the drummer in that band. And um, they're, they won Best Metal Band of Savannah wow. this year uh in connect savannah so that was great and then of course gonna plug that savannah underground immersive theater show it's a really good time we have such a good time here and um yeah yeah kristen will be orchestrating your horror experience as the stage manager so um my duty yes awesome uh chris you got a ghost tip oh gosh i keep forgetting that there are ghost tips to be had (laughs) (laughs) so uh ghost tip um, anything that you ever heard happens at midnight actually happens at 3 a.m. We use the term midnight to mean uh, 12 a.m. That is a commonality. And, we, and when we say, you know, you have to do this at midnight for it to work, we're actually participating in a, a security measure. We actually don't want people to have their seances, do their Ouija boards, do those things at the appropriate hour. <laughs> we're, we're saying midnight, and people are like, oh, 12 a.m., I'll do it at 12 a.m. It's 3 a.m. It's actually the middle of the night, and the concept being that spiritual forces will use the same psychic energy that we use when we're awake. So when we are asleep, the drinking uh, water is, you know, free. The, the area for them to get energy is not overly populated, and so they can actually be more forceful. That's why ghosts appear more at night than they do during the day, and also why if you see a ghost during the day, that's a powerful ghost. It is actually not dependent on that psychic well that we all, you know, get our energy from during the day. Ghost tips with uh, with Chris. So (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, we will see you guys again in the next episode. Uh, I said this in the last podcast episode, but we're going to start uploading every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Also, make sure to check out our Patreon if you would like to support us further and help us continue to get even bigger and better. And we're also going to have a lot of really fun content over there. So if you want to check that out, you can check the link in our bio or go to patreon.com slash the Savannah Underground, or excuse me, Savannah Underground. And also, if you want to check us out on TikTok or Instagram, we are there under the Savannah Underground. So with that being said, I'm Madison Timmons. And I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all.